I want to tell you about Philip Pyle, too. He's a visual artist, graphic designer, photographer, and agitator. Based in Houston, Texas, whose primary interests are race, humor, advertising, sports, and popular culture. Mining imagery from sources diverse as mass consumer culture, contemporary advertising to ephemera, historical imagery, and hip hop. Pyle introduces a complex vision that derives from a robust comedic foundation while also looking at the abstraction and transience of our values and beliefs. That's a pretty good description of what you do. Did you write that? Yes. Yeah, I thought so. I I All right, well, I'm going to hand the mic to Philip Pyle. Thank you, thank you. Let me put my coat down. All right. Everybody else had their mics, their mics up here. All right, let's, let's do it. All right. Cool, cool. How do we make it come over there? You want me to, oh, you want me to hold it in my hand? Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I can hold it. I'm cool, I'm cool with holding it. Let's see, PowerPoint. How do you start this thing on a PowerPoint? Oh, okay, that's up there. All right, cool. Me and PCs aren't very aren't very friendly anymore. I've 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 I sold my soul to Max. But uh, all right, so I want to talk to everybody about um, my thesis exhibition is currently up right now at the Blaffer Art Museum. Um, it's open till April seventh. Um, the title of the show is What I Found, um, and it's about uh, this organization called the Center for Black Preservation. Um, I have a family member who works for the organization. Hurry up, hurry up, come on, Camilla. Come on, have a seat. So I have a, a family member that works for the organization, and of course, uh, she knows about me being an artist and, and whatsoever, and she was like, you know, you should come and check out some of the things that we've been working on. And so, um, essentially, like my second semester uh, in school, I presented the idea of just going in their archives and pulling out some items uh, for my thesis show. So right here is just some logos of the organization. Um, this was the business card, one of their Be Safe business cards. And the Be Safe and then Drive Safe were two of their earlier uh, different programs that they uh, tried to implement throughout the country. Um, and so, I mean, it's a very diverse uh, amount of items. In total at the show, it's about 64 items. Um, cool, and I'm just reading the bottom of the screen. Um, and so, so it ranges from like ephemera, we got photographs. This is uh, Martin Luther King uh, yelling at a bunch of ministers. It looks like he's yelling, right, in the image, you know. Um, I have a, uh, a yard sign from Save Soul City. Soul City, North Carolina was a city uh, that was started back during the Nixon era. They tried to make like an all black city. Um, it didn't work out, but uh, the signage and everything is still there. But this was like one of the yard signs that was taken uh, from around that time. Uh, the Harlem Olympics, 1965, was uh, a failed attempt at a all-black Olympics in Harlem, which would have been pretty cool. Um, this is a poster for NASA AFRO, which stands for the African American Food Regimen Operation. Uh, NASA was trying to implement uh, basically dietary needs for black astronauts. And so they reached out to uh, Leah Chase, who uh, started Dookie Chase in New Orleans to prepare like, uh, you know, like food, different foods that would be suitable to black astronauts, you know what I mean? Um, here on this page, you have like some of the items on this. Um, it's like bread pudding and grape drink and some other, some, uh, some other things that would be more palatable to the, uh, to the palate of a, of a black astronaut as opposed to you know, other astronauts. His Baird Rustin, with the integration means better schools for them. This originally says uh, for all, but was edited to, uh, for them to, uh, you know, work along the guidelines of uh, the CBP. All right, we get down here. We have a, this is a, a T-shirt from a summer camp 
that ran from 1968 to 1972. Uh, it was a I'm Not My Ancestor summer camp. It was a summer camp for little white children uh, to try to re-educate them on the black stereotype and, and you know, get them to you know, look at the world in a different way. You know, a summer camp that I think would, would, could still be beneficial. Uh, this is, a, this is a, a pen, the United We Shall Overcome. This originally has a black hand shaking a white hand, but this way it's, it's flipped to uh, two black hands. Uh, this is a poster that was in the offices of the CBP, just talking about like not code switching too far. If you're not familiar with what code switching is, essentially um, code switching would be like going from me to Clarence Thomas. That would be what... If you code switch too far, you go from me to Clarence Thomas. Um, this is just a, 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 I just love this photograph because these two black kids are sitting in front of this fire playing Chinese checkers with two huge glasses of milk. And I just thought it was just like such a precious image. So uh, that's in the, that was in the show. These, this is just some more imagery from a, a protest. Uh, in, in the exhibition, I have a video that features uh, these civil rights leaders and black leaders smiling like this. This is Frederick Douglass smiling because, of course, he never smiled. And then uh, Ida B. Wells here smiling because she also never smiled. And it, it just, it's, it's about 20 different leaders, and the idea was just to you know, paint them in a different light. As you'll see here, we have, uh, this is Thurgood Marshall with this uh, stamp out Mississippiism. And on the um, tombstone is like Emmett Till and, and different people that were lynched um, around this time period. But going through the archives, it was very funny because Thurgood Marshall was like always irritated. And like every image of Thurgood Marshall, you see, he just, he just seems, he seems like just, just slightly perturbed at, uh, at every, in, in every image, you know? And I, I, you know, I'm not sure if that, you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure he was, he was being told some things that were upsetting. But uh, here's a glimpse at the uh, exhibition at the Blaffer right now. It's just, it's a lot of those images I just showed you with a vitrine that has, uh, some other images in it, including the Shadow Magazine um, that the CBP put out, along with some of the NASA items. There's also a chauffeur hat. And I learned that uh, chauffeur hats were used by uh, blacks like post-slavery to fool police officers. They would ride around with a chauffeur hat, driving with their family, and if they got pulled over, they would just put the chauffeur hat on and say that they were driving their boss's car and just taking you know, the boss's workers home. And, you know, that's something I still wish uh, could work today. But obviously, obviously not as, not as easily to fool a police officer with a hat these days. Um, also, the, these back here are some uh, racial justice greeting cards. I don't have a larger image of those, but they're fun to look at. Um, and here's another viewpoint on the other side. In the back, that raft and that trophy, I'll tell you the story about this raft and the trophy. Um, the, uh, the trophy belonged to uh, a, a painter and a professor in Youngston State. His name is Al Bright. And when he was a kid, his Little League team won the, um, they won the Little League Championship in Youngston, Ohio. And so the baseball team and the, the coaches decided to go um, swimming after the game to celebrate the victory. But um, once they got to the pool, of course, Al wasn't allowed to get in the pool as the only black person on the team. And so the coaches pleaded with the lifeguard and eventually he agreed if everyone got out of the pool that Al could get three laps around the pool in the, in the raft as long as he didn't touch the water. And so we were able, I was able to bring the raft from the archives and the trophy from the archives and so it's a pretty cool story pretty sad story but uh it's still cool indeed and um let's see i think i thought i had more images in here of all of these guys but um this is right here is a uh on the right is a monticello family reunion t-shirt i don't know if everybody's familiar with monticello 
Um, and then on the wall facing this way, you can't see it, but it's a backdrop of Barack Obama, which is the uh, CBP's like crowning achievement, essentially, getting Obama elected in 2008. Not necessarily what he did after that, but just getting him elected was like that crowning achievement. And essentially, I would say the organization just kind of took like a big pause following 2008. And so, but long story, long storied uh, organization. Uh, it's a fun exhibition. You all should check it out. It's open to April 7th at the Blaffer. And, uh, you know, thanks, Pete. Thanks, everybody, for walking back over here. <laughs> Thank you, my friend. That was so good. Well, we're getting down to it. <clears throat> we got a couple more speakers. I want to tell you just a little change in schedule right now. We had promised a panel called Unzoned Houston, and uh, we really tried. It kind of fell apart. Uh, some people couldn't make it. Some people weren't really sure that they were the right people for the panel anyway. So we have a hero here who's uh, l l jumping into the void. And uh, I want to tell you about uh, Trinity TriStar Pasco Stardust, a dominant figure in the world of intersectional art. Her work re uh, reflects her identity as a black Afro-Latina woman, single mom, member of the LBGTQ+, and a person living with multiple sclerosis. TriStar's art influence began in 2011 when she had the opportunity to work at Project Row Houses. Though she's self-taught, Trinity continues to enhance her artistic skills by taking various classes and workshops. She's currently enrolled in Art League Houston's Healing Art Program. TriStar has shown and sold her artwork at the Art League Gala since 2019, the Marty since 2020, the 2021 Houston Chocolate and Art Show, and Texas Southern University's 2022 Citywide African American Exhibition, Three Persons Exhibit at Project Row Houses Community Gallery, and the Blue Triangle's 2023 inaugural, inaug inaugural ACE Exhibition. Most recently, 2024, she was awarded the Idea Fund grant for her project Stardust Unions, an event proposed for summer of 2025. Trinity has since returned to a position on the row and finds healing in speaking on the history and her unique roots to the row story. She enjoys connecting with fellow creatives, residents of her local community, the historic Third Ward. Her work aims to serve as a powerful medium for self-expression, advocacy, and healing with no cure. Come on up here, TriStar. We want to hear from you. suggest if you grab this and just speak right into it that's going to work best because okay. it's a little, little quiet okay hello Ooh. okay hello 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 how are you i am trinity stardust uh some, known as tri to some people and i am how can i say adopted by third ward texas <laughs> um i found third ward about two decades ago, um, and I came here thinking I was just applying for an af affordable income-based apartment, um, and I found so much more than that, so much more. Um, so much more that I did decide to move on the row, which is Project Row House, and they reside in Third Ward, Texas. Um, and so when I got here, I was fascinated by like the architecture and the, the community uh, feel of Third Ward and stuff like that. And so I jumped head first into learning what Third Ward is, what it was, why was it so rich with all these fields under my feet, right? Um, and so I, I took a dive into learning the history of it. I learned that Blue Triangle houses the first uh, Dr. John Biggers mural. I learned that Dr. Yates and two other men that uh, purchased uh, the first public park in Houston, Texas was Emancipation Park. I also learned that Third War was kind of split up into two sections, if you will, back in the day, 
right? So you would have the top of Third Ward, which if you drive through even now, um, from Southmore to Alabama, you'll notice that most of the houses over there are built with brick, um, and they have uh, like um, garage apartments and such, right? Now from Alabama down to McGowan, uh, that was mostly built with wood because that was the freed slave um, area, and which was South you know, Riverside Terrace belonged to the Jewish people, right? And the Jewish people was the only people that employed the freed people, right? So they would live on the side, on the bottoms, we call it, and then they would walk to the top for their jobs. Third War became sort of Emancipation Avenue, which was Darling Street, became sort of like a um, black kind of Wall Street. It was a lot of black money there. Dr. Biggers uh, started the art department at Texas Southern University. Um, the Duprees owned the El Dorado Ballroom, which uh, sits on the corner of Elgin and Emancipation now. And we have greats like um, Ella Fitzgerald, uh, Lightning Hopkins, Tina Turner, Ray Charles. Um, those kind of legends performed in this place. And now, um, pre-pandemic, 77004, which is the area code, was the fastest growing zip code for gentrification in the country, right? Um, and um, now it houses one, the uh, first uh, black comic book store in the state of Texas. Um, so it's still like creating histories in spite of um, the new developments that have came, come in. Um, and I think what bothers me most about that is, one, the zoning is, doesn't exist, right? But also, um, it bothers me because it, it seems to be when I sit on my porch and they look down on the porch from this monstrous of a thing going up, unbeknownst to the people that mostly buy it, I'm sure, but the developers, right? So the reason we, in Third Ward, there's an organization called Project Row House, which I work at, and they um, preserve, what I like to say is they preserve the historically um, shogun houses, now known as shotgun to most people. Um, however, they did start off as shogun. Um, it's African diaspora, um, and it's a Yoruba uh, culture. Um, and the free people built those houses all along the Gulf Coast and up the Bible Belt a little bit. So that is also why Dr. Biggers um, was so fasc fa fascinating with Third Ward when he came here from North Carolina um, because he did see the Shogun houses and wondered, like, those houses, like, why are they here and in North Carolina? So he took the trek back and learned that these houses were architectural functionality, right? And so they were built that way. Yes, the doors line up. They're not to shoot a shotgun. It's just for architectural functionality. If you open both of those doors, it creates a breeze. You know, there was no air condition back then, so the breeze was much needed. Why did they build that way? Because the weather mimics Africa here, right? You will not see these shogun or shotgun houses if you go up north, right? You will see their row houses go up like the monstros that we have here, the townhouses, right? They go up because what? Heat rises. It's architectural functionality. Um, and I don't understand how that, what is happening now is kind of a contradiction to the functionality of the architecture, right? These things, uh, the, the, these townhouses, when you go there, I often tell people there's no such thing as um, southern hospitality, right? No such thing. There's a such thing as a porch, right? And when you sit on your porch 
and there's somebody sitting there, and you drive by, whether you know them or not, what you gonna do? Hey, how you doing? You know, how your mama doing? Them kids looking real good, you know? Oh, I seen your son the other day. He's coming up real good, right? But there's no porch in these townhomes. Everybody just drives straight on in the garage and goes into their houses and then looks at the people on the porch, i.e. us, from the rooftop patio, looking down. And uh, that analogy, I always correlate with my multiple sclerosis. One day I woke up and couldn't feel anything from the waist down. And I had to learn to walk again, all over again, right? And it's, it was weird because I had all the things to walk normally, but they, they didn't work, right? And so when I was in that wheelchair, what, I, what, I, what made me get up was my children, but also it was because when I met people, they did this. That was not okay for me. Just something that simple was not okay for me, right? And so I imagine now, well, I don't imagine, I live there. So I live in Third Ward now, and they have just built one of those things directly across the street from my little duplex, which sits on Row House's um, property, okay? Um, and so now, when we sit on the porch and I get my hair cut, because I still get my hair cut on the porch <laughs> by my dad. <laughs> so when I sit there now for him to cut my hair, I'm looking at somebody's garage. And then even if I'm looking at a person, I'm going to have to look up, which means I'm going to have to do the very thing that I got out of the wheelchair for, right? So my son went off to the military five years ago, came back, and it's almost unrecognizable to him, the area that we live in. Um, it has a psychological effect when your kids come home but can't recognize home, right? So I think, you know, if we had um, zoning laws and such, it may not be, I don't want to, I won't say it wouldn't be an issue because it, it probably would. Whatever is supposed to, gonna happen is gonna happen. However, I think there would be some parameters around just displacing all the history. Um, I find myself um, thinking and thanking Row House for at least owning five city blocks. Um, in, in that in whole third ward area um, because if they didn't, I would have long been displaced. Um, I can't afford to stay in third ward and buy this, pay this, or, or even afford the taxes that seem to be going up two, three times a year in, in, in the neighborhood. Um, so I just, you know, my part in this is to educate and to make people aware, challenge people's perceptions. Because yeah, it might look nice, but to me it seems to be structurally oppressive. Um, and so what happens when now we have like maybe 60% of the neighborhood gone. What happens when it's 95 or something like that, right? Then Row House becomes the odd man out. And now we look like we don't belong when we started here. And, and so, yeah. Um, Row House just turned 30. So I'm forever thankful for that. Um, and amongst those five city blocks and within our 150 odd residents, we are still a community. Um, I'm still as responsible for my neighbor's six-year-old even though my kids are grown, right? So that tone 
is what I fight for. Um, because I didn't grow up with a home, per se. I can't just go back home, right? Third Ward is my home. Row House is my home. And I was adopted by the area, um, hoping that I would be able to spend time with my grandkids the same way I spent time with my children. Um, uh, confident and secure and not worried when they're outside, even though it's, and, and it, it's weird because the, the neighborhood used to be, in the 90s, Row House started because one of the streets in Third War was the worst block in Houston, Texas for drugs and drive-bys, right? But I still feel like I raised my kids in a very safe neighborhood. Like, I would, my kids could go outside and I didn't need to go outside with them, but that's not because it wasn't dangerous. I, we just established it was very dangerous, you know? However, all of us work together. And I can assure you that if I'm inside, somebody else was watching my children. And we all work together to even get the children off the bus depending on who was working, who was off, who was their off day, feeding snacks, that, that just doesn't happen anymore. It, it, it happens still on Row House's site, but that is the epitome of community. You know, that's why, hence it takes a village to raise a child, right? That is how it happens. And if you take away the porch, it's a bigger thing than that. If you take away the tone of the neighborhood, it's a way bigger thing than that. And at the rate it's going right now, you won't recognize or remember the history. And when you don't remember something, it has officially died. So remember Third Ward, and when you go over there and you step on the soil or you come to uh, El Dorado for an event or you go to Emancipation Park, you know, or you go to the Blue Triangle, which is still standing, and I just shown art there last year um, to see the first John Biggers mural. Just remember the history, you know, and remember that when you go to Row House, you will see that all those Shogun houses are gated together. That was not done by Row House. That was done by the people who built it because they believed in communal living, right? And so that gated area, most of the living was done outside. This is why you can house a, a, a multi-families in about a 500 square feet area because most of the living was done outside. Um, so when you come in that area and all that, just remember that this start, that soil started off with community. And contrary to where it, what it looks like it's going to, that's what, what everything there was built on. Um, yeah, so hopefully, you know, Row House will still stand and I'll be back at 50 years saying, yo, we're still here, you know, because hopefully we are, because we started in 93 and we're still here. So hopefully I can say that in um, 20 years when I'm, you know, running after some great grandkids in my payoff stage officially. And, you know, so thank you for having me um, and, um, Remember that just like Third War, like healing is not an ED. It's a constant, you know? Um, it's a constant thing and you will never be healed. You will always be healing. Um, and I, one thing I, another thing I learned from walking with MS every day, but the point of that sentence is I'm walking. So you guys have a great day. That was really great. Thank you for that. Well, uh, we're, we're kind of wrapping up our speaking program and unbelievably, we're early. I thought we were gonna run late, but we're a little early. We've got about an hour and a half before our feature presentation, John, John Lomax III back there, coming up at 4.30. Uh, please don't go anywhere. Uh, anybody wanna take the mic and tell uh, tell a little Houston history story? Should we do a Houston history open mic with anybody who wants to do it? You sure you guys don't want to? Well, uh, 
hang around and, and visit with our many exhibitors and maybe buy some things and uh, have another beverage and relax. And uh, I'll tell you also, we have a little sculpture show going on here to the side. Uh, all these cool little pinwheels and whirly gigs that you see on this side of the building, those were all made by a sculptor named Paul Kittleson who has been uh, uh, close with the Orange Show since the 1980s. He teaches uh, sculpture over at U uh, University of Houston now and uh, we're gonna have these uh, sculptures up for a while but uh, please enjoy them on this breezy day. They're all uh, spinning like crazy. And um, I'll tell you one more thing. We are uh, working on a big community art project over the next couple of weeks with a sculptor named David Best. He's coming from California. And uh, David is an important early art car artist, but what he's really well known for is, uh, if you know about the Burning Man Festival that happens every year, he builds these huge temples. These are temples of loss and remembrance that he builds at Burning Man and other places around the globe. And uh, these things are huge and people are encouraged to spend time in them, write messages to, for, about lost loved ones, maybe attach a picture, maybe the thing you never got to say to your mom before she died but you wish you had, and then these things are burned at the end in a spectacular blaze. It's a cathartic moment for people. It's really kind of beautiful. And so David is coming here with his temple crew from California, six guys who are gonna build this temple, but when they come to a town, they don't build a temple for you, they build a temple with you. So we are trying to get community involvement, people to come out and work with David and his crew. It doesn't matter whether you what kind of skills you do or don't have, although really, if you have carpentry skills, we are really gonna need you. But even if you don't, there's a lot of decorative things to do too. So if you just wanna meet some cool people and work side by side with some cool artists, that's what we're doing over the next couple of weeks. Uh, if you just go to our website, uh, you will find information about this David Best build and you can sign up on the site. But I am telling you, if you know how to nail boards together, just show up. We are gonna be able to put you to work. Uh, this is between April 4th and April 11th. And then we are going to debut here at the Legendary Art Car Ball on April 12th, Friday, April 12th, the night before the parade. Uh, if you don't know, we do this every year before the parade. The night before, we have a big party here, and this is the VIP area, and there's thousands of people out there, and we've got a bunch of illuminated art cars. We're going to have David Best thing. We're going to have bands and DJs and food and brewskis and whatever you could want. Uh, so uh, please keep in touch with us. Come to the Art Car Ball. Go to the parade. It's like the most fun thing in Houston. It's Houston's biggest free cultural event every year. Mo uh, up to a quarter of a million people come out every year. It's so much fun. Uh, and uh, keep in touch with the Orange Show. And please don't go. Stick around for John Lomax.